Okay, that's all. <laughs> Thank you very much. So the topic of today is uh, CQRS Adverse Sourcing in a SCARA Act Award. Uh, first of all, before beginning, I would like to thank Barcelona Java User Group for giving me the opportunity to be here. I would like to thank especially to Jonathan and my old friend Mikros for, uh, for uh, giving me the chance to, to have this presentation. I would like to thank you guys for coming. So uh, let's dive into the subject. My name is Adrian Florian. Uh, I work in IT. Since I was fifth, that would be about 97. It's a bit ironic because this is the only uh, relation between me and ECMAScript and whatever comes to the world of the JavaScript. Since then, I've done almost entirely backend. Uh, focused on Java, lately, in the last three years, I switched to Scala. <coughs> I really, really, really like it. It's great language. I'm not sure if you're using it. Why would anyone using Scala on a daily basis? <laughs> Not so many people you should start doing it. It's, it, it's a great language. Um, since 2008, I work for Pentalog. Pentalog is one of the leaders in uh, software consultancy. It's a French company. It has uh, development centers almost all over Europe, mainly in Romania. This is where I'm coming from. Uh, I am part of the Pentalog Institute. It's a division, I would like to say, the, the, the special ops division of Pentalog. We are uh, taking care of cross cutting concerning. Uh, uh, what uh, has to do with software consultancy. We are dealing with architectural issues, we are dealing with presets, with estimation, and stuff like that. Uh, online, you can find me as AC Florian. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, let's get in touch after the presentation. You can find me on GitHub. I have a couple of uh, open source repositories there, uh, core, at Gmail, Twitter, whatever, you name it. Uh, let's set the basis for the presentation what the presentation is going to be, what it's not going to be. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, CQRS and reverse sourcing as an alternative to the more classical approach that everybody is used to it, both FRAT and REST approach. Uh, we are going to discuss a bit and gradually introduce the principle of CQRS, also the principle of event sourcing. Uh, we are going to do this uh, all in the context of a toy project. Uh, the presentation is not going to be an APA or an APA persistence uh, complete guide. There is not enough time to do it. Uh, it's not going to be an introduction to the graph database or a Python guide, and it's not going to talk about the real life project. It's not a real life project. Uh, so, this is about me. How about you? 
uh, who's doing Java for a living? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Anyone working with graph databases before? <coughs> Any other form of NoSQL databases? Okay. Document databases, I assume? MongoDB? Okay, good. ACA or ACA persistence? <coughs> I saw you, you're working with ACA or? No? No, ACA persistence. Okay. <coughs> good. I mentioned a toy project. This is my toy project. It's a cat cafe. I know that there is a cat cafe in Barcelona. I haven't had the chance to visit yet. It's on my list. Uh, the picture is from a cat cafe from Vilnius. It's an extraordinary place. Basically, a cat cafe is a common cafe, except that you have cats that are working all over the place and you have the chance to pet them, to play with them, and who knows, adopt one if you want to. Uh, this is our data model. We only care about the cats, we don't care about the cafe part. These are our entities. We have cats with name, with breed, with certain hunger level, cats do eat. We have toys. Cats love toys. Uh, as attributes for the toys, we have the name and we have the fluffiness level. We have food boys. As I said, cats to eat with position capacity and food level. Anything missing? <coughs> Little boxes. <laughs> you don't really have cats, right? <laughs> but otherwise, we would get a lot of stack over for exceptions in, in our fact. Okay, so the attributes for the little boxes, we also have positions. We have the level of sand in the little box and we have status, if it's empty or if it's full. This is the data model in a classical architecture, in a prod architecture, where we insert data, update data, delete data. We are doing this for REST uh, uh, API. Uh, anyone using REST APIs? Super. As I said, it's a normalized data model. It's classical approach for a relational database. So we have the cats. It's the main table. There you go. We have cat breeds. I decided to uh, extract a separate table for the breeds. We have a, a foreign key there, a joint between the cat and the cat breeds. <coughs> uh, a cat can have a certain favorite toy. Actually, it can have many favorite toys. A toy can be favorite by many cats. So this is a typical M2N relationship. It's the horror of relational databases. <laughs> uh, we have footballs, we have leaders, and each of it uh, might, may have a position, which is defined by a coordinate X or Y. So that's about all. We can place football solidars all over the place. Uh, we can add gas to the system. We can change the level of hunger for a certain cat, and that would be about all about our scenario. This is a standard architecture. I guess almost everyone that is working in a, in a REST architecture is pretty familiar with it. Uh, on top of everything is the UI layer. This is the interface with the user or must do with other systems. Everything that's related to communication, uh, it happens through uh, DTOs. Uh, the UI level receives DTOs and sends it, its data transfer object and sends DTOs to an API layer. An API layer is actually on top of a service layer. This is a classical example of a cat service. Uh, we can uh, create cats that we add cats to the system. We can retrieve a certain cat based on its ID. Uh, we also have query methods that uh, are able to retrieve cats based on certain criteria. Uh, I would uh, it's my personal opinion not to list the remove cat method there. I don't really like to remove cats. It's kind of scary. Uh, we have a data model. It's a rich data model. We have an ORM uh, in the Java world that would be Hibernate or Topin. Hibernate, anyone familiar with it? Perfect. And finally, at the lowest level, there's a database. Now, as I said, usually things in the modern world are happening through a REST API. This would be a classical example of a REST API. We can do post requests to an API version 1 slash cats. We send a JSON, we receive a 200 in one created. The system takes care of creating the cat for us. We can do get APIs on, uh, get a request on an API with v one cat and ID. system gets us the, the cat back in a JSON form. It can be an XML form. It doesn't really matter the serialization. We can do post on the football with a certain quantity of food in order to fill it or to update the quantity. And here are some common use cases from the database perspective. We have a new cat in town. It's actually a post on a cat URL. At the database level, this gets translated to an instance statement. It will be inserted into cats and it will add a new line here. So basically, the result of our code 
it will be just add the new line into the cache. Uh, the database level, it's basically an update on the hunger level. So it will just have like update cats and hunger level with the same today. Let's switch to football again. Same story. What happens is that it will trigger an update on the football table and to update the football. Table. So this is what's in there. And the little box, same thing, it will just change the status. So basically we have insert statements, we have update statements, and in the unhappy case of removing the cat, we have delete statements in the database. Familiar as an approach, have we done that for system in the real life, updates, inserts, deletes. Okay, what's missing, what's wrong, and what's hard to do? The idea is that every time you do an update on the database or you do a delete on the database, you are losing data. Very, very important data. Let's think of the following questions. How many times does a cat eat daily? There is no such information in the system. What you have is the hunger level of a certain cat. Hunger level is zero. Why? Because she just ate? Because she's sick? Why? We don't know. How many refuse for a football are required daily? We have no idea. What we have is the current state of the system. The current state of the system tells us if the football is empty, it's filled, it has a certain level of food in it. But that's it. How many times was that football filled last week? No idea. Which cat breed eats more? We don't know. Because we don't know how many times a cat eats daily. We don't know how many times a cat eats, eat, ate last week. We have no clue. We just know if the cat is hungry or not. Uh, when did the cat last day? Same problem. So the whole idea is that this type of model uh, that changes data, that relies on updates, relies on inserts, relies on deletes on, on a certain database, uh, is incapable of answering the questions that we haven't thought of when we start designing the system. Another problem. What's wrong with this kind of approach? Let's say, for example, that I'm planning to uh, test on my local machine, uh, what, ha what will happen if I fill the, uh, I don't know, one liter randomly? If I fill it, and let's see how the system will behave. But guess what? I forgot where it goes. So now all my liters are filled. And I was connected to the production database. Uh, that would be pretty difficult. Now I have a corrupted production database. Okay, there are strategies. I can restore it from a snapshot. That will mean downtime for my system. This, this is basically data corruption. Every time you perform updates or deletes on the database, you risk performing data corruption on your data. And if it's a production database, it's not that pleasant. That will happen to you. <laughs> not programming for long enough. <laughs> it will happen. <laughs> OK, what's hard? Well, basically, in a relational database, we are focusing a lot on the writing part. So we are normalizing the database, optimizing for write operations. Unfortunately, optimizing it for write operations uh, makes it harder to use for read operations. Why? Think, for example, that we need to uh, check for all the Persian cats that have a, a certain favorite toy, the blue laser. This is already a joint on four tables. <coughs> a joint that's most of the time expensive. And it's kind of an effort for us to think in these terms. We just want to display a list of cats, why we have to join four tables, why we have to bear with this and to end relations. It's kind of difficult. How about removing a toy from the system? Well, removing a toy from the system, if we just simply delete it from the toys table, we have referential constraints. We will have to first delete it from the cat favorites toy and then make sure that the toy is not related to any cat and then remove it. I'm sure that ORM are doing this for us, Hibernate is doing this for us uh, in the background, but it's also something like a black box that we have to live with it. And if there are any problems, it will be kind of hard to difficult, it will be kind of hard to debug it and to investigate and see exactly what is happening there. Besides that, if you want to change the database locally on your computer just to do some updates, to, some, uh, to, to delete some rows, you have to manually take care of all the referential integrities and all the constraints that are going into different tables. So deleting the toy will be kind of a mess. What, for example, if I want to add another coordinated position, I'm noticing that the cats are playing on tables, so I would like to put the football there, just to eat, not on the ground floor. But I would not want
want to do that with litter boxes. I mean, litter boxes on tables is not quite a good idea. So that new coordinate for my position table will only have meaning for the food box, but it will have absolutely no meaning for the litter boxes. But then again, since we are working in a relational database, the position table, we have to have X, Y, and Z coordinates, even if I'm not using it for, some, for, for part of my data, which is also a problem, because if you have fixed schema, you have to live with it. First, you have to think about it when designing your system. You have to conceptualize, you have to design it, and then you have to live with it through the entire life cycle of the system. And you have to run update script, and you have to do all kinds of stuff like that. What's the solution that I'm proposing? Well, the solution that it, it, uh, I, I wasn't the guy that invented CQIS and even assessing, although I would have liked that. It's, uh, uh, I guess the, the, the first guy that talk about, talks about it was uh, Greg Evans, somewhere in the Microsoft world, not even in the Java world. Uh, it was 98 or something like that. So the solution is it's, it's quite old, but even so, as I noticed among you guys, you are not using it. I'm only using it for the last six months, so it's not that popular, but it's a great solution that answers very, very well to all those problems that I've listed before. And I will try to show you how. Again, this is the classic approach that we are all using it. It's just a, a remember of it. Uh, UI communicates two data transfer objects, API services model, QRM, and database. This is my service, it's the CAT service. Basically what CQRS says, CQRS stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. It says, okay, we have two types of interactions with the system. We have commands. Commands means giving orders to the system. They are actions with the, with the potential to change the data inside the system. And we have queries. Well, queries is just a view over the data. We want to see something that's already inside the system. So what query, uh, Command Query Responsibility Segregation says is, let's split this. Let's have, instead of a cat service, let's have two separate services. Let's have a cat query service that deals with retrieving the information from my system. And let's have a common service that deals with updating the system. So this is basically the one and only idea behind common query responsibility segregation. That's the single, sorry, that's the single principle. And this is how my system diagram would look after applying CPRs. I have a query API that's completely different from the Command API, I have a query service that serves the query API, and I have a common service that serves the command API. Anyone has this type of separation in their application? Cool. Great. We have the same model for now, same ORM, and same database. Question Is this all? Well, it is from the principal point of view, but we can do more. If we have separated already the query services from the command services, there is absolutely no point in using the same model. So why not having a query model and a common model in our application? And why not let them interfere through the ORM with the database? <coughs> so far, so good. We have almost completely separated the query part from the common part of our system. Well, what's the main advantage in doing this? Some more details about the query model and the common model. The query model, it should offer rich query capabilities. It should respond in a timely manner. Most of the time, users are really patient when changing data in the system, but are less patient when trying to retrieve data from the system. When you are updating something, when you are changing data, you are very satisfied with an answer like, okay, I, the system, took into consideration when your request, the 201 accepted, I will deal with it later. It will be there. But when you are querying for data, you are you tend to get impatient. If you are on, on, on an online shop uh, website and you are trying to find your favorite product, Black Friday is coming, it, it will be hard for you to accept that the system will respond in three, four, five minutes. So this is why a query view should respond in a timely manner. It provides different view on the data. Uh, a system, for my, for my two example with cats, you can have cats by breed. You can look at the cats, you can look at the footballs. You have different perspective over the system. On the other hand, the common model is only with few right operations. Um, it's potentially denormalized. As I said, it, it's no use to use a normalized uh, model for reading data out of a system. For writing data into a system, it's great. For reading data from a system, not such a good idea. And it's far easier to scale. So that's what you should keep in mind. A read model, it's far easier to scale. If you don't write, you don't have concurrency issues. You just read, read, read. You can read for no matter what uh, 
huge number of replicas of the system. On the other hand, the command model, it should validate and process the commands. It should ensure the data consistency. This is the hard part to do it. This is the complicated part in designing and developing a software system, ensuring data con uh, consistency. Ensuring AC properties, if you have to deal with AC properties, then it, 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 it's a pain. So this falls under the responsibility of the command model and implicitly everything that deals with write operations. This is more difficult to scale, which leads us to the next diagram. If the frame model is so easy to scale, why not scale it? Leave the command API with single flow that goes to the database and replicate the query model on no matter which, uh, uh, which number of machines. Replicate it two times, three times, four times, never mind. It's just about the speed that you are serving the information to the user. So you, have to, you, you can replicate it as many times as necessary to be as fast as the user needs. Let's simplify it a bit. For the read model, okay, for the, for the command model, we need an ORM to take care of our data, to feed the missing information, to care, take care of the relation between the tables. We don't need an ORM for the uh, query model. Why not feed directly the database? Read the information from there. Read it, read, read it from a uh, single view. Read it from a document database. Read it from no matter what. We don't need an ORM. We don't need the overhead of an ORM to read the data from the database. But again, if we are querying the database once through the ORM for the command, and second, through uh, uh, the, the, the fill there for the query part, why use a single database? Why have a single point of failure when we can use a dedicated free database for our data? And update it from the command model to events, to an event handle, and to write operation. So each time a command service receives a command, the command model gets updated, sends some events to a certain event handler, the event handler writes and updates the read database. Therefore, our fin layer, it can always read updated information from the read database with, without any relation to the write database. Any questions so far? Yes, please. On the database? Yes. Is that right? What is this for? This one? Uh, is to uh, store the data. This, this is actually uh, where the uh, command service is storing its data. This is the read database. It's a denormalized view of the data. Here, for example, we have the same cat table with all the cats. Here we can have a view that links the cat with toys, with cat breeds, with footballs, with whatever. So the, the read database, it's, it can be completely denormalized. It can be actually uh, one table, all view, per screen. So it can be completely dedicated to the view information. It has nothing to do in terms of structure or the, the, uh, the HDBD provider. It doesn't really have to be the same uh, database. The read database can be a document database, MongoDB, for example. It can be a Titan, a graph database. The, 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 the DB here uh, can be Oracle or MySQL or whatever. So they are not connected. This event handler takes care of receiving events from the command order. Like, for example, okay, the cat just ate. Dealing with this type of events and updating the cat status here. So, they are completely different. Yes? Who reads from the right database? At this point, nothing. No one reads from the right database. This is just to, 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 to keep the information. Think, for example, that you need to replicate the system on another machine. You will just copy the database. Uh, this will evolve further. So this is just an intermediate step. Yes, please. So it means that in the database on right and the, in the database on left, yes. have different states? Uh, there is, yes. Uh, actually, this type of system uh, will not offer strong consistency. It will offer eventual consistency, but <laughs> this is one of the drawbacks of uh, uh, event sourcing and uh, as, as an engine for CQRS, you have to explicitly admit that you have eventual consistency. On the other hand, uh, there is no such thing as strong consistency. If you said network, you said eventual consistency. So, yeah, this type of, uh, of approach explicitly assumes eventual consistency. And very good point. So, yes, please. And how do you propagate the uh, migration from the uh, write database into the uh, read database? Uh, they are not connected. 
So if you change the structure of, uh, uh, of the right database, all you have to do is, <coughs> in the worst case scenario, adjust your events. But that's it. The read database has a completely different structure. The read database uh, is uh, actually think that it maps exactly with the screens that the user is seeing. If you are seeing five fields on the screen, you have a table in the read database representing the exact five fields. Not denormalized, no connection uh, at the schema level with, uh, with the right database. This brings us to the event source. Basically, no matter what information system can be described by three characteristics. It can be described by commands, state, and events. Commands <coughs> are requests received by the system from users or from other systems in order to change its inner state. Events are the results of commands. Commands get validated, gets checked for consistency and stuff like that. If I need to add a cat to the system, the command will be add cat, the event will be cat added. Events are always things that happen in the system. They are immutable, they never change. And finally, there is state. Every system is initialized in state zero. The world was initialized in state zero. Then it received commands. Commands were applied to a certain state, triggered events, any function of events and state, so any event applied to a certain state triggered a new state. Classical approach, <coughs> we store the state. We store number of cats, we store uh, number of footballs, we store the level uh, of hunger for each cat. Event sourcing approach describes the system in the exact same manner. We have commands, we have state, and we have event. But what they are saying is, okay, we should not store the state of the system. We should store the way that the system reached that state, hence the events. There is also a version of the event store that is called command store that stores the commands. It's a bit of an overhead because commands might never get to actual uh, applied events. Commands might never get validated, might not be okay. So it's a bit of an overhead to store commands. This is why the proposed approach is to store events. If you look at it, both systems are described in terms of the same functions. There is a function that applies command to a certain state, leads to event generation, applying events to a state leads to a new state. The only shift in the paradigm is we are not storing state, we are storing events. Some examples, a command will be add cat to a firm, then cat added to be the event that we are storing in the system. <coughs> Unlike the traditional approach that inserted the new role in the table cat, this time we store this event. Feed cat, we store the event cat fed. Play with cat, we store the event cat tired. And optionally, hungry, happy, we don't know. Fill football, then the football is filled, the box is empty when we issue a command to the system to empty the little box. Things get a little bit complicated in terms of diagram. You win some, you lose some. But this is actually how an event, uh, how an event sourcing system uh, is basically looking like. We have the same query API through a thin query uh, reads from the read database. But then again, the system uses the common service. This is an optional part, the common queue, in order not to uh, have an extra overhead, not to overload the processor for the commands. Uh, it is recommended that all the commands going, uh, coming to the system to pass to a common queue. It's usually a, a, a GMS queue. It's an active and queue or a rabbit and queue or a Kafka. The whole idea is to uh, leave the system to consume the commands in its own uh, pace. So not being forced to consume them as they arrive. Uh, this is also uh, uh, handled right recently with uh, streams, ACA streams and Eric streams in Java instead of a, a, a simple queue. So, as I said, instead of storing the data, as in my previous diagram, I'm storing the events now. So, this processor stores the events in the command model and also stores them in the events database. Okay, so far. In terms of event storage, each event should have a minimum number of properties. They are listed here. We should have an event ID that will allow us to identify the event in the system. It should have an aggregate ID. Uh, familiar with domain event designs? Worked with it? Now, uh, the aggregate ID comes from the, from the domain event design. It's actually a, an, an atomic unit of work. It's something that has meaning only for itself and it's only connected remotely to other uh, aggregates. So this is actually the target, uh, sorry, this is the target of the event. 
Then it should have a version, this is used for the serialization. It should have a timestamp. The timestamp is uh, the moment when the event was uh, issued in the system. This is extremely useful for recreating the events. And it should have a payload. The payload is actually the serialized, serialized representation of the event. So this is the minimum required information for an event to be stored in an event source architecture. Event sourcing. We have the following advantages. Implicit, reliable audit system. Do you use audit tables in your applications? Do you have, uh, have you logged all the actions from the users? This comes out of the box of event sourcing. If you work in regulated industries, it's a, it's a must to have it. So every change, everything that impacts the data on your system must be logged. With event sourcing, you have this out of the box. You don't have to do anything for that. Uh, it's a time machine. Uh, you have the timestamp of each event from time zero since now. But if you are replaying the events from time zero until two days before, till Monday, Tuesday, you have the exact state of the system Monday or Tuesday. So you can replicate the system at any moment in time starting with time zero until first in time. You have the ability to answer requests not yet foreseen during the initial phase. If you have Every, every action that ever changed the system, you can ask anything about the system and get the answer by simply replaying the events and logging what you are interested in. You have immutability. As I said, if you are updating data and if you are deleting data, you are already losing data. If you have immutability, your data is there, it's safe, it's well kept. You have out of the box replication. You have one machine, the system is running. You need to install it on a different machine. You initialize the system on, on T0, you replay all the events, you have the system up to date on the second machine. Disadvantages. Possible duplicate code. Everything that has to deal with domain driven design needs to duplicate code. Most part of developers are not familiar with event source based implementation. Can you confirm that? <laughs> it requires more resources. Uh, this is more or less of disadvantage resources. Physical resources are cheap right now. Memory is cheap. Uh, CPU time is cheap. Uh, why it requires more resources? Because each time a system needs to be initialized, it has to replay all the events. And it can be millions of events. Tens of millions of events. Eventual consistency explicit it was one of the questions, a very good one. You have to make it explicit. You have to assume that you have eventual consistency in the system. And there are serialized events in the event store in order, this is a, uh, a drawback between a performance and human readability. Usually events are serialized using serializers like Protobuf or Avro or Cairo, so that they are not human readable. I have a solution for that later in the slides, but uh, by default they are not human readable in order to be performant. This is a sequence diagram, it's a classical sequence diagram, it's secure as with event sourcing. There are two main use cases, there is a Command use case, state one, there is the client that issue a command to the command service, the command passes to a command actor, this is the archive implementation, and the event that is stored in the journal storage. Uh, there is a small hack, a workaround, uh, it's called the snapshot storage. Uh, snapshots, snapshots are used to store uh, temporary state of the data at a certain point in time. They say that we have a billion events that were run on the system since T0. Uh, we don't want to replay them every time the system is worked out. So we store a snapshot at 900 million events. And then we will replay the events starting with 900 million and replay the last 10,000 the last events that were triggered to the system since the last snapshot. <coughs> and finally, the read case, where the read case is just uh, a query issued to the query actor that will read from the view storage. The view storage, again, is completely denormalized. Questions so far? Yes, please. Sorry? Snapshot storage here, yes. Do you have the edit? In the snapshot storage is actually an intermediate state of each aggregate. It's, uh, it's not the, the view storage and it's not even. Uh, running 
defined from a certain aggregate leads to a certain inner state of that aggregate. This is what is stored in the snapshot storage. Because once you run a certain number of events on an aggregate, it will reach a certain state that is more or less stable. You store it in a snapshot and then recreate the events starting with the time you store the snapshot data. So this is it. Uh, it's not connected with the view storage. The view storage is just there to answer queries from the user. And now, the last part of the presentation, the technology stack. Everything is based from the architecture perspective, but if we don't have to, to implement it, it's not so great. Uh, this is my proposal to implement such an architecture. Uh, it is my proposal coming from the perspective that I'm working with SCARA, and I'm working with ACA, and I'm working with Titan database, hence the graph database. This is why my proposed two step for implementing such an architecture relies on SCARA, ACA, ACA persistence, and Titan database. Uh, it is not the only way to implement this type of architecture. As I said, uh, uh, this type of approach emerged in the Microsoft world. I'm sure that the .NET guys have their own uh, version of implementing it. There are other libraries that you can use to implement it. There is no need to use Titan, for example, for storage, uh, not for journaling, not for uh, snapshots. You can use no matter what, or which database. Hacker Persistence, for example, offers a large number of plugins that interface with uh, almost any database you can think of. But again, this is what I'm proposing because I'm most familiar with, uh, with this type of tool stuff. So, ACA. Uh, ACA, it's basically an implementation of the famous actor model. It deals with uh, actor that is the uh, atomic unit point of computation. Think of actors as humans, for example. They can do a single task. Uh, they communicate with other humans only through messages. Uh, this is extremely uh, useful in terms of uh, load management and scalability. If you don't have a shared mutable state, you have no issue with uh, concurrency and you have no issue with scalability. You can scale no matter what, at, at which level. It's open source. Uh, it's quite a mature framework. It's version 2.4 something right now. It's JVM based, so it works great in Scala, but it also works extremely well in Java. It had, uh, actually, I guess that more than 50% of active users are using it from Java. Which is a bit strange considering that the, the library was implemented in Scala. Uh, TypeSafe, which is the, uh, the, the company behind ACA, is strongly switching to, to, to Java 8 and what's to come Java 9. It's highly concurrent, distributed, resilient, message driven application. This is basically uh, the idea behind the actor model. You have an asynchronous message that gets sent to an actor. Uh, each actor has its own mailbox. A mailbox is like a, a queue of messages. It allows the actor to process the messages at its own pace. So uh, it, it will not get overloaded by messages. Each actor has an inner state and it has a certain behavior that is triggered either by the message it receives and by the state. Uh, in the context of your question, in the snapshot database, what is persistent is actually the state of each actor. Uh, ACA persistence has a one-to-one -one correspondence between an actor and an aggregate. Uh, what an actor can do, it can process messages uh, in order to update its own state. It can send messages <coughs> to other actors. It cannot communicate to other actors in any other manner than through messages. And it can change uh, its own behavior. Uh, ACA has a great implementation for finite state machine. It's super. ACA persistence. Well, ACA persistence is the event sourcing engine implemented by ACA. It offers out-of-the-box message persistence and sna snapshot persistence. Uh, it has a bunch of journal plugins, it has a bunch of snapshot plugins. Uh, all the plugins are open source, they are implemented by the community. Uh, one of them is implemented by me. Uh, you can find it on the, on the uh, ACA community webpage. Uh, it's the plugin for uh, Titan. Uh, as I said, there is a equilibrium that you need to find between performance and human readability with data. Uh, a lot of the plugins are persisting the data in a non-human readable form, serialized with protobuf or trial or avro. It's almost impossible to read it from outside. What the Titan plugin is doing, and a new version will be released hopefully by the end of the week, is that asynchronously it persists also JSON serialized form of the data. So you have the best of both worlds. It persists the data in a protobuf with no impact on the performance, 
and it processes the data in a JSON serialized form in a Titan database, so we can query it manually and look at it. And the code is available. Uh, why would I use NoSQL? Remember the first problem with uh, relational database and with data normalization and with M2M -M relations and with fields that need to be there, but they don't really need to be there, fields that are not used. NoSQL comes with schema-less alternative. It's clearly not the next step in the evolution of the relational database. There are two things, two separate words. They can work very well together. There, there are a lot of systems that are uh, implementing point to consistency using old SQL databases and old SQL databases. There are ACA persistence implementations that are using MySQL for general persistency and are using, for example, MongoDB for persisting the views with no problem. But again, it's a lot easier to accommodate database structure changes when using NoSQL databases. You need a new field, you just add the new field, and you feed the information there. You don't have to care about old data. That field will simply not exist for old data. It will just exist starting from now. Uh, you can avoid SQL joints. The document database, for example, you can denormalize everything there. You can just put everything in the place there where you need it. It's easier to handle differences between related entities. If you ever use the hierarchy of entities in Hibernate, it's it's a nightmare. Uh, you have a lot of strategies with single tables, with joint tables. With, it, it, it's a nightmare. There are fields that are going over. There are joints that are happening at each select you are doing. This is not happening with no relational databases. Why a graph database? Because it uses associative data model uh, unlike a relational database. This type of associative data model contains, it, it's composed of vertices which are actually, if you are thinking of vertices, are actually uh, the rows in our table, in our relational database. And it has edges. Edges are the relations between the vertices. Edges are first, first class citizens in graph databases. You can add properties to edges. It's, so you, you can add timestamps to edges. You can just query for edges. You, you don't need relations as, as you need in a, in a relational database. Uh, they are known to scale more naturally than uh, relational database to large data set. They are highly intuitive. This I can prove with the next slide. They are popular in the context of emergent social applications. If, uh, if you say Facebook or Twitter, you already said graph database behind it. If you said LinkedIn, it's a graph database behind it. Uh, arguably, they are older than relational databases. They appeared somewhere in the 60s or 70s. They were called hierarchical databases. They are left behind because they require more resource than uh, a relational database. But now with uh, the technology getting cheaper and cheaper and the resources getting cheaper and cheaper, people come, came back to, to the graph databases. The leading provider of graph databases is Neo4j. Ever used it? No? Heard about it? Uh, Titan is one of the providers of graph databases. Titan was, was recently acquired by Datastax, which is the company behind Cassandra. Uh, the product will still remain open source, but it will be backed up by a commercial company with strong impact on the market. And this is the new model of our toy project in a graph database. As I said, it's a lot more intuitive than normalizing data to tables. Here, for example, my cat has a name, has a grid, and has a hunger level, everything in a single vertex. The relation between the cat and the toy is represented by an edge. You can add properties to edge, edges. Since when this cat is in love with this toy, how much you cannot ever levels, you cannot editing without the need to uh, artificially introduce uh, a relation table, an extra table that we simply do an M2M -M relation you know, in a relational database. So, what's missing no more? How many times does a cut hit daily? Remember the question from the first slide? Well, in our event sourcing architecture, all we have to do is count all the events of type cut fed for a certain aggregate, and we have the answer. How many refills per ball are required? All we have to do is count all the events of type football field filtered by a certain time interval, and we have our answer. The idea is that we can answer to questions that we never thought when we first designed the system by simply storing everything that led to the current state of the system instead of the current state. Which can read it more is just counting the events of type CAFED, again grouped by aggregate ID and grouped again by the grid name. So it's extremely easy to get out of your system all type of information you never thought about. When did the K last year? Again, it's a query over the event. What's wrong? Are the litters 
delete the status one. Forget the where clause. Remember the problem when we messed up the production database? Yeah. So what? We just reset and recreate. What we messed up, it's not the system. It's a snapshot of the system. It's a temporary representation of the system that we are only using it to get faster, easier access to the data. It is not the system. The system is represented by the events which are fully immutable. You can't mess up the events. You mess up the current state of the system. We create the events from state C or from the last snapshot. We have the system back up again. No downtime. So what's no longer hard? Adding a new coordinated position thanks to no relational databases and to graph databases. As I said, you just completely starting from now for the data you are interested in to have it. You know, you, you don't want to have it for all data. You're not feeling it. It's that easy. Removing a toy from the system, where in the context of relational databases, remove, uh, removing a toy consisted in removing the relation between the toy and all the cats and then removing the, the toy itself. Here, you just have to remove the toy from the graph databases and it will take care of, for, for you of removing all the edges that are uh, adju adjacent to, to that particular toy. So removing one vertex from the graph databases removes all the edges pointing to that vertex out of the box from the inner state of the graph database. Creating any complex view over the system, just denormalize. Use a document database, for example. Put all your data there. Use the query model to query the document database. Read the data in the form you like it for reading. And finally, what to take home with you there is a very nice theorem that applies in computer science, applies in mathematics, applies every life. There is no free lunch. Basically, if you optimize some part of the system, you lose uh, on the performance on other parts of the system. If you optimize data for storing the events, you lose a little bit on the complexity because for us, the developers uh, using relational databases, databases using CRUD architecture, it's a lot more easy to understand because we are, we are used to. We are not used to think in terms of event storage. Uh, you need to make eventual consistency explicit. This is kind of a major problem for uh, conceptually speaking. Uh, there's no thing happening. You win some, you lose some. And no cats or actors or actor cats or how it is making this presentation. <laughs> if there are any questions, comments, concerns. Yes, please. We have a question uh, regarding the graph database. Yes. I understand it is not the uh, store. Uh, the graph database, uh, on my plugin, for example, it can be used both as an event store, as a journal store. It can be used both as a uh, snapshot store. Because actually, a couple systems allows you to uh, plug two types of plugins. You can plug a, a plugin for the journal store, where you store the events, and you can plug another plugin for the snapshot store. It can be the same plugin, as is the case with Titan and the case with the application that I use. Uh, it can, uh, there can also be different plugins. You can plug for the event storage, for example, a level DB, which is a new local database, and plug Titan for snapshot storage. So it's up to you. Everything is pluggable. Uh, Aka Persistence only offers the entry point to the uh, custom plugin that you are planning to use. So you can store your events in no other way that which database and not related to the, the snapshot. I would recommend storing it in Titan because uh, storing it in Titan offers you the, the, the possibility to have this serialized both uh, in, in, in a photobuff uh, and human readable format. So if you want to create the events from a third party application, you have this possibility. It's not a must. Uh, on the other hand, you can implement your own plugin for your preferred database. It's pretty easy. There are several interfaces that you need to implement in that support. Uh, we also have a question. Yes, please. Colombia. Here us uh, regarding event sourcing. What happens when you lose events due to whatever? How do you mitigate potential losses, assuming that you care about them? If you lose events, you are losing your data. So you have to be careful not to lose events and you have to replicate your journal storage. That's, I mean, if you lose events or if you use network during events, event persisting or if you... Every, every system has a, a so-called core information. If you are losing your core information, you are losing the system. So 
So that means you would get your replicate to the events and then somehow try to make sure you're executing twice the same event. Of course. Of course. But you can replicate the event, uh, you can uh, basically replicate them as you, you would replicate any uh, other database by simply creating slaves of your database, or you can replicate the events by simply storing them uh, on multiple servers once the event uh, uh, becomes active in the system. So you can just send it to multiple databases. But again, this is a problem of replication, it's a problem of uh, data maintenance that you have to deal with it somehow manually. So it's not something out of the box. Think that the events are the core of the system, if you are using the core of the system, you are using the system. So you have to be careful not to use that. Uh, 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 a good advantage over the traditional approach would be that uh, you cannot uh, screw the events on your own. You know, I mean, the, the network can do that for you. Uh, uh, a server failure can do that for you. You can't do it on your own. Unlike with the traditional approach. I'm not sure if that answers your question. It does. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. So you are uh, persisting events on your right database. Yes. And in your read database, there's a state or a view of the state. The read, the read database, uh, it's a denormalized view of my data that uh, it's 100% suitable to what the user of my system wants to see. So it's an exact representation. It can be a one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence between the screen of the system and the read database. My question goes to uh, the hard questions that this model answers. And it's like, uh, how many times blah, blah, yes. blah. Uh, you have to model that in your read. Of course. Of course, but you have the possibility. If you haven't foreseen the request when you first designed the system, you will have to model it. That's clear. You will have to regrade the events, add a certain listener to it, and count those events, the one that we are interested in. The advantage is that you have those events, and you have this information unlike the traditional approach, where you don't have it anymore. Even if you remodel, you only have one field in, in, in one table. You don't have the information about what uh, led to, to the actual value in that field. You have the, the, the hunger level for like one cat that is five. If you want to ask a question about how many times uh, the cat ate, there's absolutely no way to answer, no matter how you redesign your system. Unlike with the events, if you know, okay, uh, fed, played with, fed, played with, with the certain values, and you have the evolution that the hunger level was 10, 8, 5, 7. If you want to see how many times uh, she ate today, you just count the events of type cat fed today with the timestamp of today. So you have to do that. You have to replay the events so it's not coming out of the box. But you do have the data. But if you have to replay the events, shouldn't it not be easier for that to have um, also an event uh, storage in post reading? But you do have the event storage. But you are not the reading journal. The journal from story. That. Sorry? You are not reading from that. No, you are not reading directly from that. This is meant only for replicating, replaying, answering to questions you have not asked before, but you are not reading directly from the event uh, storage. Uh, who is reading directly from the event storage is the ACA actor at the time of restarting the system, for example. Think about it. Uh, when you restart the system, the system starts from T0, initial state. Then the actor, it's coming and it's reading the information regarding its own aggregate from the event storage in order to inflate its state to the current state of the system. So this is how the actor rebuilds itself. Think about that. In, in, in our toy example, one actor is one cat. If the cat ate three times and you reboot the system, that cat is in initial state. It might not even be added to the system. So you have to recreate the events from the, the journal storage. Cat added, cat fed, cat played with get fed again in order to get the current state of the system if you reboot the system. In that case, you are not really getting information from the read database. You are getting information from a, an application. I'm uh, getting information from the read database in order to show it to the user. The user should not be impacted about rebooting my system. How the system creates its own state. It's the system, uh, the, the system problem. It's not the user problem. The user only sees the read database. The final <coughs> the system. It sees the read database. The read database is not impacted. The read database is only impacted when a new event is coming to the system. This event gets passed through the event processor and updates the read database. It adds a new cut to a certain, I don't know, view. It 
changes the status, changes the name, changes the way to protect. <laughs> it does something to the view database. The view database is there, it's persistent. On another hand, the event storage is not accessible to the, to the user. The event storage is only accessible to the inner part of the system. And the system uses it in order to reinvent itself in case of problems, in case of restarts, in case of replicating for different machines. But that's it, that's all. Yes, please. And in case of data corruption, so the end user sees that the data is corrupted and the view database is corrupted. If the so, for example, somebody overfed the cat. Yes. Yes, so how events, you know, how to identify which event, you know, did that? How but to recover? This is, this is another great advantage of such an approach. Uh, you would identify that by simply uh, deploying uh, a brand new system on your local machine and recreating the events up to the moment that the database crashes. So you have so that means events for two years are... That means events for, for two years in the uh, eventuality that you haven't yet stored the snapshot. If you store the snapshot, you will just uh, install the snapshot, deploy the snapshot, and create events since the snapshot, the snapshot was stored. So if you have a snapshot from yesterday, you only have to recreate the events from last night. And that's so it. just to be lucky, I just have snapshots every hour and I'm fine, you know, but uh, basically I don't need anything, I just... Our couple systems gives you the possibility to store snapshot on request, or gives you the possibility to snap store snapshot depending on the number of events that uh, were sent to a certain aggregate. Think, for example, that uh, you might have data in the system that never changes. Uh, you have no need to store the snapshot for it. But you don't have to implement that manually. You will just store the snapshot for, 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 uh, for uh, the actor that received, for example, more than five messages. So think about your cat that was overfed. You will not have snapshot with all the other 300 cats because they receive no events. But you have a snapshot of your cat because she ate five times today. <laughs> That's it. But again, the, the snapshot, the, there is no relationship. There is no direct relationship between the snapshot and the view database. The snapshot is just the state of an aggregate. It's the state of one cat in the system. The view database is what the user sees. It can be a list of cats. It can be a cat with breeds. It can be, I don't know, a cat with toys together, everything. So what the user sees. So my first question was, yes. how do you find this event, you know, that overfed event? Or you just... You can just, no, you can, you can just think put conditions on the cat aggregate and count the number of, uh, of events. If it's more than five in the last two hours, so, uh, there are uh, listeners, uh, there are uh, two types of listeners that you can attach to an aggregate actor. One type is the view listener that is in charge of updating the view database. Another listener is the one that is actually listening to all the new events coming to the system and <coughs> implement your own functionality there. For example, listen to all the events of the type cat and count them. If a uh, uh, cat feed, and count them. If there are five in the last hour, the cats are okay. And you should worry. But you have to, I mean, if, if you need your own business logic, you have to implement it. So it's just that's business, that's business logic to defend or Yes. Happening. Yes. If you need your own business logic, you have to implement it. Uh, IBM Watson is working on implementing business logic for us, but it's still far from doing it and being capable of doing it. Yes, please. Um, if, if, for example, the, the commands, if you have a REST, REST API and your commands, you want them to be uh, what they are synchronous, and uh, you just don't want to, for example, when you want to create something, a cat, uh, you want the, the, the response when the cat is created. Uh, how uh, does it work with the uh, architecture that you show? That it looks like more asynchronous, right? Yes, you, everything is asynchronous, and usually if you have a REST API and you are uh, uh, issuing a command that uh, it might lead to a long-running operation. The creation of the cat is not necessarily a long-running operation. Uh, the, the common way of handling this is to uh, return to the client the 201 OK or an accepted, uh, I guess it's 202. Uh, something like, OK, I, the system, uh, will take care of your request and I will create the cat for you. Please come back in five minutes and see if the cat is ready. Th this is eventual consistency. You will have to handle it. So the cat might be created, but it might not be necessarily available in the view of all your cats playing in the room and stuff like that. So it will be there. So, sorry. Yes, please. But also, you, uh, in, the, in the response, uh, uh, apart from the 200, 201 okay, uh, created, you can uh, send allocation ID to the, yes. to the client of the API yes. with some identifier that um, can, uh, can query for the status of this creation of the cat? 
till the moment uh, this, uh, this card is created. If you manage to reach, uh, in, in terms of uh, REST APIs, if you manage to reach, I guess it's level five in, in the pyramid of Richardson, uh, it, it's hit to us. So that will basically give you an answer that we say, okay, we took care of your request, so 200 to accept it, please check the following URL <coughs> to see if your cat is ready. We are currently cooking it. <laughs> Bad visual. <laughs> yes, please. So I can handle for you, let's say, the, the state of the journal and the, the snapshot. Yes. So what happens if we have billions or trillions of cats? How can uh, we distribute the, the load or the memory that is in use to handle all this stuff? It will, it will indeed consume a lot of memory. Uh, there are tests uh, that in one uh, gigabyte of memory, uh, they were able to fit about 500,000 acres. So... It's quite okay. I mean, it's quite common to have 32 uh, gigabytes of memory for your for your own laptop. So everything needs to live in memory, then. Yes, it needs to. Live. The inflated state of an actor lives in memory always. Uh, think that not all actors are in, are, are in an inflated state. If you have not interacted with one of the cats, uh, its a coding actor will not even be initialized. Okay. There are also possibilities to uh, forcibly kill an actor if it was not active for the last. I don't know, two hours or a certain time interval, and you just kill it. And every time you need to interact with it again, the actor will load its state from the event, uh, from the journaling database, reinvent itself, and perform the changes you need. And this is done automatically by Akka Persistence? This is done magically by Akka Persistence, yes. All you have to do is configure the plugin and tell it which database you want to use for your, uh, for your uh, persistence level. Per persistence cool. Yes, please. I have a question regarding the. the situation that uh, an error occurs, you have uh, explained it. You, um, you take from the snapshot point, the latest snapshot, yes. and we execute all of the event. One question for me is that uh, something I, I don't understand is the, uh, the read uh, database, how is rebooted? Because in some house, it's in a bad stage. Uh, you, can, you, you can simply repeat it from So the, there is, there is some, uh, some procedure to to it take from the from the, um, the all the all the uh, aga persistent all, well, all, all the aggregates on the, on the current status to fill to, to fill the the no. database there, in one shot. there is no out of the box functionality offered by Aka or Aka persistence for yeah. that. It's something you have to manually implement it. Uh, it's what I answered uh, him already. Uh, it's actually, it, 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 uh, it's strongly related to your business context. Because the view database, it, it can be anything, it can be in any shape you like to. So this is something you are building for yourself. Aka, what, what Aka offers are two type of listeners. One that it's uh, able to uh, actively <coughs> listen to all the events that are flowing into the system and do something with it actually update, uh, and another one that's more like a view that is able to listen to all the events in the eventuality of the system restart. In which case you have it available and simply rerun your code that is used to, uh, to build the, the, the view database. This is actually, even if it might seem as a drawback, is actually a great advantage because if you have data corruption in your view database, you can just rebuild it from scratch. If you accidentally corrupted it, you can rebuild it. Yes, please. In the case of snapshots, so you restore from, you're not replaying all the, all the events. Yes. The yes. So you restore it from some snapshot and execute, I don't know, a thousand million events. So how do you view database? So you need to synchronize on how to do snapshot of view database. So Only you're not replaying everything. You're creating view database yes. from scratch and you need somehow to apply whatever state was yes, there. The the, the so one of the strategy will be to uh, have some type of functionality that combines the snapshot into a, a representation in the read database. This is something you have to do it manually. Another, if the system, uh, the, the, the life cycle of the system is not extremely long, the recommended way to do it is just clear everything from the read database and replay all the events. So this is the recommended way to do it because this way you are sure that uh, uh, a potentially bad snapshot has no uh, negative influence on your read database. But then again, uh, 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 I noticed that there are a lot of questions on the, on the read database. The read database is probably the, the, the least important uh, part of, on, on the entire system. I admit that it's what the user is seeing, and this is indeed important, but it's extremely ephemeral. You can do 
no matter what you did, you, you, can, you, you can spoil the data there, you can completely remove it, you can dump it, rebuild it in a different form. All you have to do is change your code and recreate the events. That's it. So the, the, the read databases, and you, you can have multiple read databases, for example. You can just switch it uh, in, in the back of the application without the user actually being aware of it. You can have uh, five, seven representations of your data and just switch your application to read from any of the, of the representations. If you uh, found that one of, of, the, of the read databases is corrupted, you will build a new database in parallel and just switch the application to that one. So you have this possibility. You, uh, the, the framework, uh, I guess the main advantage uh, with this framework, I mean, there, there are two. One, it offers immutability, which is the golden rule of, uh, of, of, of data uh, management right now. And the second one, uh, it offers a, a kind of a zero risk world of, uh, of, of data management. You have no problem. If your system gets corrupted, you can rebuild it. That's it. Uh, it. It might take some time. Again, if the number of events is really, really, really big, it, it will take some time to rebuild the system. It will not happen overnight. This is why snapshots are used. But you can do it. You have all you need at, at, at your disposal. Yes, please. Um, I would like to know how the business logic at the end is, is, is or where it's located, because at the end you have command to work from one side and from the other day, then you can have less. So at the end, you have a kind of leave the business logic around, or is it just on the, uh, the, the, the uh, event persistence? So uh, actually, the ACA persistence part that is handling both the snapshot and the event is not related to your custom business logic. There are listeners for those events that you can implement and where you would put your business logic in the system. There are also a characters. You have a receive method with the body. That method receives events and receives events with all the information from the event and the ID of the aggregate. That will allow you to, to perform operations on that. So you, you might have one actor that listens for one cat. You might have one view that listens for messages for all the cats or the events of a certain time and stuff like that. This is where your business logic goes. So at the end I understand then why you said that the duplicate code appears on. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, there is, a, there is a small risk with that. But this is also a risk that is, it comes from the domain different design approach. Because in the domain different you have to identify the bounded context. So uh, a cat for you might not be the same as a cat for you. From the perspective of the uh, uh, cat cafe manager, the cat might be just a you know, object that it goes all over the place and leaves hair all over the place. From the perspective of the customer, it might be something very cute. But you have to uh, implement the class cat in, in, in both of the object projects with a coding application of the code. Cool. Uh, if there are no more questions, I'm not sure if I can. Uh, uh, Changes the input of the public or not the output. Can you can switch the other. Oh, what? 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 What?